There's an epidemic in America's criminal justice system. The prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to the American Justice Podcast. Your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller, come together to bring you the inside scoop on all of the wrongful conviction stories, both new and old. It's not only about the innocent who have been in prison, but also the victims of crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now, here are your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the American Justice Podcast, where we talk shit and we talk crime, but, but we, we never, never talk, talk shitty crime. crime. <laughs> All right. Hey, C. Derek, it's been a little bit, been it a has. couple weeks since it's, we've it uh, has. been into these uh, nice people's uh, car radios or home speakers or wherever they're listening to us. Kmart parking lot. Uh, well, is that's, that is that still a thing? Is Kmart still a thing? I'm not sure. Not around here, I don't think. I don't, I think, I don't think it is. I heard a couple years ago that there was like one. But I didn't, uh, I don't know if it's closed or not. It's kind of like the, there was one blockbuster left in, in Oregon. Yeah, right, then, right. It's still there, too. Yeah. It's still there. I do have one for you. What's and that? This is, this is going to take everyone uh, in a little trip in the Wayback Machine. Sure. I, uh, I was at the mall the other day. Yes, the malls, the, which are all also <laughs> dying. Malls, the mall? malls are dead. <laughs> okay. But not in Dallas. There's, there's a couple of really high-end malls in Dallas. And I was going there. I was going to get my wife some C's candy. For mm. Valentine's Day, C's candy is amazing. Yes, it is. I was walking through Macy's. No, Macy's is not paying me to talk about them. <laughs> I was walking through Macy's, and they had a sign up, coming soon, Toys R Us. What? Macy's has purchased the rights to Toys R Us, no. and there will be sections of every Macy's now that has a Toys R Us section. Oh wow, so, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how intricate it's going to be. I don't. The only reason I went to Toys R Us under my own free will as an adult, <laughs> I guess. I, I remember getting dragged there by my parents when the Cabbage Patch dolls came out that Christmas, oh, and no. people were fist fighting in the aisles <laughs> for them. But I remember going there as an adult to get video games. Mm. So I'm not sure if. Macy's is just going to sell toys or if they're going to sell electronics too. Hmm. Yet to be seen. We will find out soon enough. But Toys R Us is making a comeback. I remember when I was uh, like a long time ago, probably 10 years ago, I remember the last time I went to Toys R Us, my nephew was turning like five or something like that. And I was like, where the hell do I go to get the five-year-old a gift? So I was like, I'll just go over to Toys R Us and ask. So I had to hail down one of the people that worked there. And I was like, what would I get a five-year-old boy? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, all, it was always hard trying to find someone to help you at Toys R Us. Oh, yeah. They had probably 100 employees in each store. You could never find anyone to help you. <laughs> right. And since they've all closed down, I think they've all migrated to Home Depot. I think all of those, <laughs> all of those uh, customer service representatives now work for Home Depot because you can never find anyone to help you there. All of those mysterious people that work there but are never seen. <laughs> never, never seen, and when you do manage to find one, they have no idea what you're talking about. Well, and obviously Home Depot is not paying us. <laughs> no, Home Depot is definitely not, not definitely paying Definitely not us. paying the American Justice I've Podcast. I've heard that they pay other people but they're not <laughs> paying the american justice podcast well um so see derek we have a new format we do and we, we need to format. uh explain to everybody and in case uh we have some listeners i'm, I'm hoping that we have some listeners that are sticking around from previous seasons previous oh i'm sure they are season one and season two and uh, the vincent cozy and brandon woodruff cases right well, right now we're going to be doing one case a week Right. Mm. Gosh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be so nice not to uh, just, well, who, who's to say that this is going to be the format moving forward? But season three, <laughs> this is definitely the format. This is what we decided, and you can't change our minds. So there. <laughs> and if you'd like to. <laughs> if you'd like to change our minds. That's leave what us the, a voicemail. That's right. Leave us a voicemail. That's what the comment section is for. Uh, would you go ahead and spit out that phone number right now? Because <laughs> you know damn well I don't remember it. You can never remember. 972-942-0444. Yes, what he said. Go ahead and leave <laughs> us a voicemail and uh, let us know what you think about the show. And, and maybe season four will be completely different. But for right now, season three, you're going to get a different case every single week. And it's just, it's going to be a little bit of a break for us not having to deep dive into these cases for 
10, 15, 20 plus episodes. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little, little different. These are, these are going to be cases that most people already know of, but they might not know everything about. Right. And there's going to, and, and we're going to still stay around the wrongfully convicted. Exactly. But it's going to be people that are, have been released. Right. And we'll also have some episodes like we, uh, upcoming in a couple of weeks, we have our Julius Jones episode. He's still in prison. Uh, but there's a big movement that shows or that believes that he's completely innocent. And there's a big movement that believes he's completely guilty. You so, know, I wouldn't be doing my job as color commentary if I just <laughs> didn't bring to the attention of our wonderful listeners that you just said the word movement twice. <laughs> well, you know, I am uh, uh, an EMT, so uh, <laughs> that is, that's I true. do have to deal with people's movements uh, sometimes. Oh, that's but. horrible. That's so horrible. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm actually a full-time writer now. That, yes. is, that is what I do every day of the week, day in, day out. I get up, I work out, I write, I watch TV, <laughs> I play video games. I work and out, and I write. I, and then I write some more. That's uh, right. That's, that's it. That's, that's uh, my entire life now. I have officially retired uh, from, from the art industry. From the art industry. Yes. I, I might still do some freelance stuff every now and then. Dallas Art Fair is a really big deal. Art Basel in Miami once a year is a very big deal. I've already uh, had people make me offers that I would be stupid to turn down <laughs> to go and freelance at both of these art fairs. But for the most part, I'm, I'm a full-time writer now. Living, living that writer dream that I, uh, that I had all those years ago, and it's discipline is important mm-hmm. and it's awesome because we get you more yes. here at the american justice yes. podcast you're you're not having to share me with uh the <laughs> the, the dallas elite and their art collections now oh come on just say it the art whores yeah, the art whores of dallas <laughs> <coughs> jerry jones <coughs> right 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 um, anyways uh, um but uh uh you know starting off season three we have something very interesting we have a voicemail that yes. was that was left for us yes. in, in the interim here. And uh, it's from a guy named Dan from North Dakota. North Dakota. North Dakota. Let's, you know what? Let's listen to it first and then we'll, uh, then we'll react to it. Okay. All right. Here All we right. Go. This is Dan Sianovich from Fargo, North Dakota. I'm calling to give my response to the first four episodes of season two. You asked at the end of the opening statements episode if I'm convinced that Cozy is guilty, and the answer is yes. Um, for him to be innocent, I have to believe that a cop completely fabricated incriminating statements by three different family members, and I don't believe that. Um, I'm wrongly convicted myself. I was wrongly convicted in 2007 of federal threats. I later got the charge overturned, so... I've seen the system up close. Uh, It's not always pretty the way it operates, but there are definitely bounds to it. And you guys, I I don't know what your career uh, has been up to this, but it's pretty clear to me that you haven't, you haven't lived in the same world that I've lived in. And you haven't, you know, you, you imagine things, you imagine things are possible that aren't, you imagine things could be different when they can't. And you take a very superior, condescending tone toward uh, normal things that don't mean anything. And you completely ignore the, you know, huge evidence that shows that you're wasting your time on a guilty person. So four episodes in, I mean, maybe, you know, I'll probably keep listening because I appreciate your style. But, yeah, I mean, I think as far as actually helping the innocent, I mean, if you're trying to just entertain yourselves and entertain us, fine. You know, it's it's entertaining. Obviously, I'm going to keep listening, but uh, don't <laughs> don't try to tell me that you're actually helping innocent people because you're not. You're absolutely not. This guy is obviously guilty. There's really there's no question about it. I mean, four by by four episodes in, if there was any doubt about it, you know, I'd have seen some hint of it, and I haven't. So um, anyway. Uh, I actually know of someone who is innocent. It's a, it's a black man who's innocent, and I'm not going to tell you guys about it because uh, you're you're just not the only, you're not the venue for this. Again, my name is Dan Sianovich, and I'm in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, thanks. All right, Scott. Well, I'm going to let you, you you go ahead and you say your piece, and I'm going to say mine. <laughs> 
Well, first of all, I want to say that I appreciate listeners calling and giving us uh, voicemails and opinions uh, on both sides. You know, those that support the things that we're doing and those that uh, think that what we're doing is is getting off track. But I will say, uh, first of all, I want to invite Dan to call back. Hopefully he's listened to the rest of the six episodes by now. And um, I want him to call back and, and leave another voicemail and see if he has changed his opinion at all. Right. But, uh, but I, I think that, you know, given, take away the, the, the statements by the family. If you think about what evidence do we have that shows that Vincent was guilty, the only piece of evidence that they have is a supposed ear witness who didn't even know Vincent and had never met him and had only heard him right. a couple of times in the background. And, you know, I think that to, to convict somebody of murder and put them away for the rest of their life because of that one piece of evidence, you know, that's just crazy. Because the whole he said, she said with the family, that kind of stuff, like, you can't, you, you don't know, it's not a concrete piece of evidence. You don't know who is telling the truth. We don't know that the police are telling the truth, and we don't know that the family's telling the truth. So to me, that evidence just gets put aside because we don't have credible evidence on that. But the one thing that they were able to bring up that showed that he was guilty was the ear witness. But there's also so many other things that showed that he was not guilty. They took the soil from the bottom of, of, his, of the brake pad on his car and compared it with the soil uh, at where the body was found and they didn't match. Um, you know, he, the cell phone records, uh, he was uh, calling Stephanie, you know, several times in, in between the times that they said that he was with him. Why would you call and text somebody when you're sitting right next to him? You know, there's just all kinds of stuff that, that just brings a lot of question. I think it's, uh, Pretty incredulous to say that you know there's no question of his guilt. Go ahead, Chad. Right. I'm just gonna I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say, and then we're gonna move on because this is this is <laughs> another season. Uh, first of all, all we have to go on is the evidence, the evidence that was presented in court. We were not there during the murder, so we can't say for a fact that this he was actually guilty or innocent. All we can do is look at the stuff presented in court and come to our own conclusion. Our conclusion is that he is wrongfully convicted. As far as us not helping anyone, you obviously, Dan, have not listened to the first season of the American Justice podcast. We <laughs> were we are knee deep in the Brandon Woodruff case from season 1 and we are helping quite a bit. I recommend that you go back and you listen to season 1. And, and hear everything that we have done and are currently doing for the subject of our very first season. And the final thing I'm going to say is, yes, I, you have been, you, you, were, you were brought up on charges and your charges were job, dropped. Congratulations for beating out the system, sir. I am a former member of the Hunt County Sheriff's Department where I worked in jails, I worked in court, I worked in transport, I worked in statistics. I even had beside or behind the scene jobs where I would make social media profiles, fake social media profiles to catch pedophiles. I have been in law enforcement for Jesus Christ, what was it? 13 years? I sat in courtrooms day after day after day. I watched criminal trials, I watched uh, divorces. I, I've seen it all from top to bottom. Misdemeanors all the way to felonies. So yes, my life was engulfed in nothing but the legal system day after day for 13 years. So yes, I, I have seen with my own eyes and heard with my own ears attorneys giving their limited attention, limited performances, depending on whether or not they were appointed by the state rather than hired by the defendant or the family member. 
You're get you're getting their reduced fee, but you're also getting their reduced services, their reduced attention. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've heard it with my own ears and have been spoken to by attorneys themselves, not all of them, but some who say that is exactly how they operate. If they're not getting their full amount of money, you're not getting their full education. So yes, no, my, my life for a very long time, and let's not even begin to talk about the amount of mental damage that you get <laughs> from being in law enforcement that long. Uh, some of the things I have seen are just absolutely terrible. I'm not saying all law enforcement is like this because I know it's not, but you have those few and they most times happen to be the loudest among the few <laughs> who are just they are they are in that career for the wrong reasons. I've even been approached by members of the law enforcement community where I used to work and uh, they tried to recruit me into the clan. So Yes, maybe not in Fargo, North Dakota, Dan. This type of disgusting action doesn't happen on a day-to-day basis. But down here in middle of nowhere, Texas, buddy. (laughs) It does. It does. Well, you know, that's... uh, So, like I said, it's, you know... I would be interested to see if he has a different opinion. But if not, that's fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But we definitely are trying to help everyone here and... And, you know, we're helping Vincent as well. A lot of people don't see the things that we've sent to, like, the Centurion Project, the Innocence Project of Wisconsin on Vincent Kosey's behalf. So we are advocating for him, and we are trying to, um, you know, show that there's not just the family that, that believes he's innocent, that somebody, an independent source, has taken a look at all of the evidence, and we determine that we believe, more than likely, the guy is innocent. Nobody can say for sure. Nobody knows 100%. But what we can tell you, and I think we demonstrated very well in the season, is that this guy did not get a good, a, a fair trial. No, not at all. Not at all. That's, that's very easy to see by all the court transcripts that I read during the writing <laughs> and the podcast itself. Because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's not like I remember everything I wrote listening to listening to American Justice podcast as it comes out sometimes is a big surprise to me because it's it's been a little bit and I don't remember everything <laughs> I put on that page. Yeah, and then sometimes we add stuff in post production right, so, and yeah. you know that's And sometimes I'm intoxicated. So <laughs> All right. Well, see, Derek, today we're going to be talking about a pretty bad case when it comes to wrongful convictions. We're actually going to be talking about Ryan Ferguson. You know, and this is a case I know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> well, you're about to find out. I, I know. So <laughs> just just to to the people that are listening right now, my, my reactions to this is 100% legit. Anything yeah. I say from this moment on is not scripted. It is 100% <laughs> legit because I know nothing about the Ryan Ferguson case. Well, and to be honest, nothing you've said earlier was scripted. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. No. <laughs> I'm, uh, besides, but, I don't know how to read. <laughs> but he sure can talk. I, mm, I got a pretty mouth and I speak out of it. Mm. <laughs> your Stories on Video is the perfect service to preserve all of your memories for generations to come. If you've ever thought to yourself that it's time to get all of those precious memories down on video, now is the time. Here's a quick sample of one of our videos. My name is Daryl Kaiser, and and uh, I was uh, born uh, in 1925 in uh, Canby, Minnesota. The happiest day of my life well, has to be when I got married. Yeah, that, that would have to be my happiest day. I uh, sat down in a in a, in a chair that was several chairs and there was women on the opposite side and I looked, a guy ordered me a drink and I, and I looked down that way and, and Betty was looking at me. <laughs> so I winked at her. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, I, you know, then I went and asked her for a dance, and we we danced, and 
and uh, several, several times, and and uh, and then I asked to take her home. I can't say that I ever gets out of my mind at all. Daryl hired your stories on video because he wants his grandkids and their grandkids to hear from his own mouth and his own likeness what his life was like. He also shared the family ancestry as only he could. Going back and researching archives are one thing, but watching the person that lived it is so much better. The process to get a video is very simple. Just go to www.yourstoriesonvideo.com and request a consultation. Then one of our experienced story consultants will work with you from the beginning to the end to make sure your video is exactly what you want it to be. Many kinds of individuals and families utilize our service, from the older generation wanting to pass down their wisdom to those that have an unfortunate medical diagnosis. Contact Your Stories on Video today at yourstoriesonvideo.com. Mention the American Justice Podcast and receive a 25% discount. My name is Ryan Ferguson, and I'm here to, to talk about our legal system and how it operates. So now let's talk about the actual case. In the early morning hours of November 1st, 2001, 48-year-old Kent Heitholt was murdered in the parking lot of the Columbia Daily Tribune, where he worked as a sports editor. He was last seen alive by a co-worker, Michael Boyd, who told police that he had a work-related conversation with Heitholt in the parking lot between 2.12 a.m. and 2.20 a.m. Now, do these these guys, they work together? Yes. Uh, Ryan He's Ferguson, a co-worker. He, he worked. Oh, no, not Ryan Ferguson. Uh, Kent Heitholt and oh. Michael Boyd. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, Michael Boyd was a co-worker of, uh, of Kent Heitholt. He was a sports writer. Oh, okay. And so they had a conversation at... Two o'clock in the Between morning. Between two twelve and two twenty, the parking lot. Right. Nothing good ever takes place at two a.m. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I did a, a ride along one time with a cop. It was an overnight shift. It was over in Fort Worth, and he said, "You know, Scott, there's only two things out at this time of night. There's cops and robbers. Pretty much. And we're the cops, and they're all the robbers. Pretty much. And that's the way that uh, that's the way a lot of those cops think that." Work overnight. And pregnant women wanting French fries from Whataburger. <laughs> that too. Or so I've heard. Well, minutes after the uh, 2.12 to 2.20 a.m., janitor Shauna Ornt stepped outside for a cigarette break and saw two shadowy figures near Heitholt's car. She ran back inside to get her supervisor, Jerry Trump. Guilty. <laughs> Jerry Trump. Oh, my God. Jerry, I'm so sorry. Jerry, Jerry. Trump. Uh, both janitors witnessed two college-age men near Heitholt's car. The janitors reported that one of the men yelled, Someone's hurt out here, man, before both men walked away through a nearby alley. The janitors notified other employees and called 911 at 2.26 a.m. Heitholt was found severely beaten with a blunt object and strangled. On the same evening, 17-year-old high school junior, high school junior, Ryan Ferguson, and classmate Charles Erickson were attending Halloween parties in the area. Ferguson and Erickson later proceeded to meet Ferguson's sister at a bar called By George. <laughs> well then. By, well, By George. Because, of a, because a bouncer who worked there would admit them despite their age, despite being in high school. The cool uncle. Of course. After the two men had spent all their money at the bar, Ferguson's sister bought them a few additional drinks before they departed. Why couldn't I have a sister like that? I need a sister like that. Do, is there anybody out there want to be our sister? <laughs> that will buy us drinks <laughs> without asking questions. Yes, yeah, don't ask any questions. <laughs> well, Erickson was under the influence of cocaine, Adderall, and alcohol that night. And the following day, he had no memory of what had happened. At a later hearing... Attorneys asked Erickson whether he had noticed anything unusual on the morning of November 1st, such as, you know, injuries or blood on his clothing, but he stated that he had not noticed anything out of the ordinary. Okay. Orrent told police that she got a good look at the young men while Trump reported that he was unable to see them clearly. Police recovered unidentified fingerprints on and inside Heitholt's car. 
as well as an unidentified hair in his hand. Hmm. You know, see, Derek, this actually goes back to Norma Woodruff from season one. She actually had several unidentified hairs in her hand when her body was found. While police also recovered footprints from the blood at the crime scene, Orant provided police with a description of the men, and a composite sketch was drawn. Okay, so Orant got a, I guess, a good look at them. Right. Well, she said she did. She said she did. <laughs> she said. Trump did not. But remember, it was also late at night, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, you may have some lights or whatever in the parking lot, but right. That, you know. It's, it's Missouri. I, I, assume, <laughs> I assume in 2001 they had electricity there. Right, right. Now, see, Derek, you might think that this was some pretty good information to go off of for the police to catch whoever did this. However, the crime went unsolved for two years. Two whole years. Two years. Two years. Two years later. <laughs> two years later. <laughs> yes, that's what I was trying to do. Then in October of 2003, local media again covered the case. Erickson had reportedly experienced several dreams about the crime after having seen a newspaper article, and a few days later, Erickson asked Ferguson whether Ferguson believed that Erickson may have been involved in the murder. Okay, so let me get, the, let me get this straight. Okay, so the guy, he's, he's all coked out. He's on Adderall. Adderall, alcohol, coke. Uh, yeah. 17 years old at a bar doped out of his <laughs> mind. Right. And then he starts to have dreams, dreams. flashbacks. Right. Okay. I, I get it. <laughs> so then he goes to Ferguson and asks him, Hey man, do you think I might've had something to do with this? And if Ferguson was smart, he would have said, yeah, you had everything to do with it, man. I just, <laughs> it I just all stood you. there. I looked at you like, I don't know what the hell this guy's doing, but you know, he's my bud and we got to We got to stick together and, well, Ferguson actually reassured him that he was not involved in the crime. Use the Jedi mind trick on him? Yes. He, you were not a you part were, of this This murder. was not your crime. Ferguson reassured him that he was not involved in the crime. Erickson says that over time, he began to increasingly ponder the murder and the fact that he could not remember that evening. In November of 2003, Erickson read an article on the local newspaper that included a sketch of a possible suspect. Erickson thought that the sketch resembled him. Narcissist. <laughs> and became more concerned. He told friends Nick Gilpin and Art Figueroa about his worries, and they notified the police. Does anybody in this town have a last name like Smith no. or Jones? None of these cases do. No, they're, they're all <laughs> like really crazy, complicated last names. Yep, that's the only they're, one. They're all, they're all Pogancies instead of <laughs> Millers. What is up with right. that? In the recorded interrogation, Erickson seems to have little knowledge of the crime. He told police, it's just so foggy. I could be sitting here fabricating all of it. So it's not a matter of flipping out and I don't know what's going on. We know you know what's going on. Maybe you forgot some of it, but you didn't forget all that you're telling me. Number one, I just went and looked at this guy's crime scene photographs, but hopefully for the last time until I, I have to look at him again. Multiple, multiple, multiple contusions, hits, and strikes in this guy's head. There is no way in hell that you hit this guy once, turn and got sick. If you only hit him once, turn away and got sick, you had to hand the thing off to Ryan because this guy's got head wounds all over his head. We're talking minimum 15 strikes. I must have done it then. I mean, I don't know okay. if that or I stopped and he did, I don't know. Did you ever drop the pipe? Probably. Did you hand it off to Ryan? I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. So when you say that you must have flipped out, then maybe you flip down and hit this guy more than once. Yeah. God. <laughs> I can just, okay, 17-year-old seven, kid. Two, two thousand. Well, he's 19 by this Nin, point. 19 yeah. by this point. Whiny coke addict. <laughs> you, you didn't read it correctly, Scott. Oh, sorry. It's just so foggy. <laughs> I could be sitting here fabricating all of it. <laughs> well, at one point, he was asked questions about the weapon used to strangle Heitholt. Erickson replied that he thought it was a shirt. When the police officer told him that it was not, he replied, maybe a bungee cord or maybe a bungee maybe cord. A, I don't know. Maybe a bungee cord. <laughs> Eventually, the officer told Erickson that the weapon was Heitholt's own belt. Erickson replied, I don't remember that at all. Let's go back to when you were talking about how you saw Ryan strangle this guy. Now... 
we know what the guy got strangled with. That's kind of the thing I've been holding back from you. Uh -huh. All right. Is it possible that you know what he was strangled with and just didn't want to tell you? Because I, I know. I, no, was. like I think it was a shirt or something. Or okay, well, I know it wasn't a shirt. It was like uh, maybe a bungee cord or I don't something from his car. I don't okay. see why he'd have a rope in his car. Well, we know for a fact that his belt was ripped off of his pants and he was strangled with his belt. Really? Yeah. Do you see a belt in Ryan's hand? Something look like a rope maybe or a bungee cord? I don't know. Okay. You didn't put anything in your hand then? No. Okay. I mean, I don't remember that at all. Okay. After much prodding by investigators, Erickson eventually told them that he and Ferguson robbed Heitholt for drinking money. In March of 2004, Erickson and Ferguson were arrested and charged with the murder. Now, wasn't the sister buying them drinks? Yes. Okay, so what do they need drinking money for? Well, remember when they ran out of money? That's when oh. that's when sister had to buy him, buy okay. him drinks. And also from the standpoint of a horror novelist, uh, using the guy's own belt to strangle him, <laughs> that's awesome. Oh god. That will get used <laughs> by me at some point. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying. Well, the government offered Erickson a plea deal in exchange for testimony against Ferguson at his trial, which took place in 2005. Along with Erickson, Trump testified that he had seen Erickson and Ferguson at the scene. Trump testified that while he was in jail on unrelated charges, his wife sent him a news article about the crime. He claims that as he removed the newspaper from the envelope, he saw photos of Erickson and Ferguson and immediately recognized them as the two men standing over Heitholt on the evening of the murder. Would you point to that individual or individuals, please? Yes. When on the witness stand, Erickson provided a detailed description of Ferguson strangling Heitholt despite not remembering any details following the murder and during the interrogation. The defense countered that all of the evidence found at the crime scene pointed elsewhere. The crime scene outside the newspaper where he worked littered with physical evidence bloody footprints, fingerprints, and even hair. But none of it matched Ryan. None of the hair, blood, or fingerprint samples collected at the crime scene were consistent with those of Ferguson or Erickson. And no traces of the victim's blood were found in the vehicle that Ferguson was driving the night of the murder. Ferguson was convicted of second-degree murder and robbery and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Now, this is what, this is what I don't get. I've, I've had quite a few of those blackout moments in my life from, you know, excessive drinking or perhaps some experimentation with some illegal substances. We were all young once, but, you know, it was always something like, wow, who is this lady and... How did I get in her bedroom? Or how <laughs> how did I drive an hour from that concert last night to get home? I, I don't recall. It, it was never, holy crap, where did this blood come from? You know, it's, it's <laughs> never that. I mean, what a wild life these guys are living. Straight out the gate, 17 years old, Coke and Adderall. I mean, they already sound like a country song. This is Missouri. And, and just murdering people. Uh, I mean, man. you know. It's, oh, it's I what, don't know, and that's the problem. It's what they, it's what they do in Missouri, I guess. I, 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 I've been to Missouri a few times. Been to Kansas City. <laughs> nice place. Cool. I'm, I'm, okay, there, there was somebody, if, if you guys remember correctly, there was somebody that called in, in the middle of season one and left a voicemail, and they, it was, I can't remember if it was a voicemail or if it was a comment on something, but they, they got on to me for making fun of... <laughs> Of cities, cities or, and, and states towns and, and whole states, states in the entire country because I, I've been lucky enough in my adult life to travel the entire continental United States several times. There's not a single town or a single highway I have not visited. But I like Missouri. It's okay. <laughs> they let 17-year-olds drink free there. Sisters. Isn't, isn't uh, Missouri the show me state? It is, the and, and they did. And they showed them. They, sh they showed them yes, all right. They showed them. <laughs> Now, I have to interject here, C. Derek. What we have here is yet another case where they have no physical evidence whatsoever and only some circumstantial evidence. There have been many studies out there about the reliability of eyewitness testimony. I feel like it's a little bit because of Erickson saying that he was there and he was with Ryan and he murdered this guy. But 
he got so many facts wrong and he admitted that he was on drugs at the time and everything that he, quote, remembered was shown to him in a dream. If that doesn't spell unreliable witness, I don't know what does. Well, the difference is with these other cases, though, is that these these dreams and these visions and this information is all coming from one of the defendants themselves rather than a witness. This is insane. Who wakes up in the morning and just goes, oh, good morning, Mom. You know, I think I might have murdered someone <laughs> last night. Nobody does that. What? Right. I mean, was this was it, this guy? Was he just wanting attention? Did he did he think you know he was going to get some TV time or whatever, and then they were going to slap him on the wrist? And he was. Did he not understand that this was this? I don't know what they do in Missouri, but I imagine there's an electric chair there somewhere. <laughs> then does he still use the electric chair in places in the South? Right. So. You know, if I if I ever woke up in the morning and thought, you know, I might have murdered somebody last night, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, you're not going to tell anyone. <laughs> Well, plus, you know, in this trial, all of the physical evidence, all of it was pointing somewhere else. There was no fingerprints that matched. There, the blood didn't match. Like, none of the footprints they got didn't match. Like, nothing physical matched these two guys. But he was pushing so hard. They're like, look, look, man, you're, you're way off. No, none of this evidence or the, the physical evidence we have, none, none of it points to you at all. And he's like... No, I'm pretty sure we <laughs> murdered the guy. <laughs> right. Just shut up. Shut up. Well, following the conviction, Ferguson gained a following with the wrongful conviction advocacy groups. In 2009, high-profile Chicago attorney Kathleen Zellner took over Ferguson's case, working pro bono. In 2012, both Erickson and Trump recanted their testimony in statements obtained by Zellner and her investigator. In the subsequent habeas corpus hearing, both Erickson and Trump admitted that they had lied at Ferguson's trial. Erickson claimed that the prosecutor, Kevin Crane, pressured him into implicating Ferguson. Erickson testified in the habeas hearing that he could not remember the evening of the murder because he was so intoxicated with drugs and alcohol, and that night he was just blacked out, causing his amnesia. Trump recanted the story about his wife sending him the newspaper article, and he claimed that Crane had pressured him into testifying against Ferguson, saying that he had first seen the newspaper photos in 2004 at the prosecutor's office after he was released from prison. On more than one occasion, he said, quote, I've got the right two guys, almost like a cheerleader, Trump said, also alleging that Crane had shown him a Tribune newspaper with Ferguson's photo that Crane mentioned that it would be, quote, helpful for Trump to identify Ferguson as having been at the crime scene. You know, see, Derek, we covered another instance of this type of behavior from the prosecution in season one with the Brandon Woodruff case. Absolutely. The prosecution had shown Eric Gentry, the one that had seen Brandon's dagger before the murders, a picture of a sword that was almost two feet long. However, they showed it to him on an eight and a half inch piece of paper, so it looked a lot smaller. Then, when they showed it to Mr. Gentry at trial, he did say that looks a lot bigger than what he remembered seeing in Brandon's closet. In fact, he was first questioned a week after Brandon was arrested. Mr. Gentry told Texas Ranger Jeff Collins that the dagger had a four to six inch blade and a three to five inch handle, making it about eight to 11 inches total. Then the prosecution reveals that this almost two-foot sword is the murder weapon. The only reason that Mr. Gentry identified that sword is because it was shown to him on a small piece of paper just a week or two before the trial. These kinds of manipulation tactics are unfortunately too common with prosecutors all over the country. Because we can't imagine Jeffrey Collins exaggerating the size of something. <laughs> like not not at all, not not at all. Any anybody in that Brandon Woodruff case? I mean, you know these these are these are gentlemen from the South. I'm I'm sure they're all fishermen. I was talking about fish, Scott. That's what I was talking. I about. I was going to say maybe that's why he does it with the lights on. Uh, ha, ha. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Michael Boyd, the last person to have seen Height hold alive in the parking lot, was also called as a witness. When questioning Boyd, Zellner elicited a timeline from him that placed him with Height Holt at the time of the murder. The court cited these critical admissions in its opinion. Boyd's five conflicting stories 
were known before the hearing, but he had never been called as a sworn witness in any court proceeding regarding the case. Okay, five stories? Five conflicting? There's only two people that did the killing, and he's got five? What is he, backup stories? What are these? Well, this is him, and so he's basically saying, remember he said that he talked to Kent Heithold between 2.12 and 2.20. Oh, yes, yes, the, the two men who were up to no good in the parking lot. At right, o'clock. so, yes. yeah, so that's what he said originally, and that's how they started, you know, going down that path, but now... Zellner's coming back and finding out that he had a very suspicious timeline. Okay. So Zellner filed an original writ of habeas corpus with the Missouri Court of Appeals, Western District, citing a number of flaws in the criminal trial. Notable among those were proof that the prosecution withheld evidence from the defense team, the Brady violations. Okay. Uh, while questioning prosecution investigators at the habeas corpus hearing, Zellner's law partner, Douglas Johnson, uncovered that during an interview with Trump's wife, she had told investigators that she did not remember having sent him any newspapers. This interview was not disclosed to the original defense team. The Court of Appeals described, quote, a pattern of non-disclosures by the police and prosecutors that contributed to Ferguson's conviction. No. You don't say. They don't. They don't. Our Dan from North Dakota even said at the very beginning of this episode that they don't do that. No, they don't lie. Dan, who's telling the truth here, buddy? <laughs> Come on, call in, Dan. Call in, let us know. All right, Janitor Shauna Ornt, who witnessed two men fleeing the parking lot, testified that she had told Crane that the men whom she had seen on the night of the murder was not Ferguson. She claimed that Crane had repeatedly tried to induce her to implicate Ferguson and that Crane became threatening during her last conversation with him. Despite being the sole witness who had reported that she could identify the men at the scene, Ornt was never asked in court whether or not she could identify Ferguson. Zellner alleged that the prosecution did not ask Ornt to identify Ferguson because they knew that her answer would bust their case. What kind of a person do you have to be to bully the janitor? I just, I just want to know. <laughs> of, of all the people, all the people in this case, the witnesses in this case, you got to bully the janitor, right? And it, and I mean, just bullying everybody. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. Like, where, when did, when did we lose that sense of getting to the truth and getting to the answer instead of just getting a conviction? When Ryan takes a stand. He denies Chuck's accusations. Did you go to the Tribune parking lot? No. Did you see Kent Heithold anywhere? No. Did you participate in this murder? No. His lawyers are confident the jurors will believe Ryan more than Chuck, that the interrogation tapes undermine Chuck's credibility, especially since there's no forensic evidence to corroborate his story. I've got to tell him what that man did. But the jury believes the now self-assured Chuck they heard testify. We couldn't see no reason why he would have gave himself up for 25 years of his life. He looked over at Mr. Ferguson and the pleading look in his eye, like, come on, buddy, you know you did it. You might as well fess up. It takes them just five hours to reach a verdict. We, the jury, find that defendant Ryan William Ferguson guilty of murder in the second degree. Other evidence that had been withheld from the original defense team was related to the time frame of the murder and Ferguson's and Erickson's movements during the evening. Erickson had testified at Ferguson's original trial that following the murder, he and Ferguson returned to the bar around 2.45 a.m. and were admitted by the same bouncer, Mike Shook, who had admitted them earlier. Erickson claimed on the stand that he and Ferguson had left the bar between 4 and 4.30 a.m. However, Shook testified that the bar had closed at 1.30 that morning, and bar patron Kim Bennett testified that Erickson and Ferguson departed between 1.15 and 1.30 a.m., disproving Erickson's claims that they had returned to the bar following the murder. And that was going to be a question of mine right there, is I know here in the great state of Texas, you know, we're all supposed to be a, like Old West rough and tumble Texas, but, you know, gambling's illegal. 
everything else is illegal here. It, it, <laughs> Texas is a myth, people. Run the other direction. But the bars, <laughs> like, e- even since I, you know, well, since I, when I was a younger person, the bars close really early here. I, I remember turning 21 and going to a bar and being super pissed off that they're trying to put me out on the streets <laughs> at like two o'clock in the morning. And, and, you know, you got these two guys they are like, Oh yeah, we were at the bar at like four 30 AM. Where? Yeah. Where? It, it, is, is Missouri better than Texas? Right. We're, we, we need to find out. Well, that's like in California, you could buy Jack Daniels at uh, Walmart. Yeah. You know, it's like, and I think you can, you can also buy in California. You can also buy liquor on Sunday. Now, they yes. just recently made that a thing here in a tech in Texas, I believe. I think up until recently. I don't know if it passed or not. No. Not, it they, isn't they passed. still close on Sundays. Yeah. No liquor on Sundays. No you liquor. can you can you buy, buy beer, but it has to be beer and wine after twelve. Twelve. After yeah. noon. I think they did change that. I think it's now eleven AM. Oh. What's an hour, <laughs> man? What's an hour? I mean I don't know. I, I compromise. Can't, I can't have my seven AM <laughs> Sunday morning beer, then screw all of you. I think it's a compromise. You know, it's an actual um, lawmakers actually compromising, working together to come to a compromise. I know that it doesn't happen these days. My but. opinion, but what does it even matter? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not. I'm not getting in my car and slamming a six pack and running over a family of four that's leaving church at 11 a.m. Okay, right. I'm gonna roll out of bed at like 7 a.m., 8 a.m. Still half screwed up from the night before. I'm a writer. <laughs> that's what we do. <laughs> and I'm going to have my morning beer to cure my hangover. That's right. But I don't have any left because I'm also an alcoholic, and I drank everything I had in the house the night before. I'm going to run to the corner store and buy me a beer at 8 a.m. It's none of your damn business what I'm drinking at 8 a.m. or what I'm buying at 8 a.m. Why does why do I have to wait till 11? Well, you don't have to wait till 11 every other day. It's just Sunday. Well, that's the only <laughs> that's the only time I want to go buy a beer, though. <laughs> Well, you can't have Chick Fil A or buy a uh, beer. I can before. live without the Chick Fil A. Me too. All right, all right. Ferguson's conviction. You're going to be happy to hear this, see Derek. But Ferguson's How dare you read my mind like that, sir? <laughs> Ferguson's conviction was vacated in November of 2013 on the basis that the prosecution had withheld evidence. You don't say from the no. defense from the defense team. That news when it finally reached you, that on your last appeal attempt, that that finally the courts looked and said, wait a minute, this conviction needs to be overturned. Were you mentally prepared to handle that news? I'm I'm sure it was hard to be mentally prepared to handle the news that you might stay in prison longer, but did it take some getting used to that you were getting out? It still takes getting used to. I I didn't know if I was actually going to get out when I got that news. I was somewhat skeptical, and a week later, I ended up getting out. And even then, it was, it was strange being free again after a decade. I had missed my 20s. So coming back out into the world was a very scary prospect, and I'm still trying to figure it out. You, you mentioned you missed your 20s. I mean, and, and I would imagine it would be harmful to dwell on that, yeah. but I don't know how you can't dwell on that. You just try to, try to move forward in life, and, and I always look at, like, the 30s or the new 20s, right? So uh, <laughs> I got a lot I want to do in life, and it's just about focusing on the day and not really worrying about the past and what you missed. It's just trying to, to bring the best future possible. Following the reversal, the state attorney general announced that he did not plan to refile charges against Ferguson because, quote, Ferguson had presented overwhelming evidence of his innocence in his habeas corpus petition a mere Brady violation would not have prevented a retrial. So the case remains unsolved, and in 2013, the police said that they are considering reopening the case. From my research, I have not seen anything that shows that they have reopened that's, yeah. it. As of this moment, that's nine years ago. So Right. All right, so post-release. On March 11, 2014, Ferguson filed a civil lawsuit against 11 individuals as well as Boone County, Missouri. Is that where they make Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill? Maybe. And the City of Columbia in U.S. District Court for the Western District of Missouri. The suit alleged suppression of exculpatory evidence, fabrication of evidence, reckless or intentional failure to investigate, malicious prosecution, conspiracy to deprive constitutional rights, false arrest, and defamation. 
The suit also claimed that following Ferguson's release, former prosecutor Kevin Crane and former Columbia police chief Randy Boehm harmed Ferguson by continuing to make statements about his guilt. The defendants included several police officers as well as Crane. Ultimately, all defendants were dismissed except for six police officers. Okay, so somebody's going to get their comeuppance here. (laughs) Right. In an October 2020 settlement hearing, a judge awarded Ferguson $11 million. Yeah, baby. $1 million for each year that he had spent in prison and $1 million for legal expenses. I thought Catherine Zellner was pro bono. But, yeah, no, no doubt. Well, she had investigators. Well, and all there's that also stuff, court so costs. Court costs, investigators, yeah. paralegals, all that stuff. Right. In the hearing, attorneys for the city compared the settlement to an Alford plea, not admitting liability, but admitting enough evidence exists that they would likely lose in court. Now, we're going to hear some more about that Alford plea later on in this season. Yes, when we talk about the West Memphis Three. Exactly. The reality is that. 10 years of your life are spent in prison. You can't just get out and get your life back. You can't just get out and say, hey, let's go party, let's go have fun, let's jump into a career. It's not that easy. I worked hard so that I could do those things, but regardless of all the hard work I put into it, my family put into it, it's just not that that simple. So Charles Erickson remains in prison for the crime as of 2022. He's serving a 25-year sentence in exchange for testifying against Ferguson. Despite the fact that Erickson had implicated him in the crime, Ferguson has vowed to help Erickson with his release from prison. Quote, there are more innocent people in prison, including Erickson. I know that he was used and manipulated, and I kind of feel sorry for the guy. He needs help. He needs support. He doesn't belong in prison, Ferguson said. The Ferguson family has offered a $10,000 reward for tips that may solve the case. Erickson should sit there and rot, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it, he, he put himself there. He put both of them there. He's, you know, I kind of think we might have killed somebody last night. Well, then again, he was on drugs. Well, if he's not serving 25 for the murder, maybe he should serve 25 for perjury. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Or, or having a horrible imagination, one of the two. <laughs> what, what were you doing in your spared time, mister, that made you have fake dreams about you killing people? Right. You know, maybe we're doing society a favor by having him incarcerated. He seems Who's pretty... to say that the dreams weren't just the beginning? He seems pretty cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Yes. The dreams could have just been the beginning. If they hadn't have put him in prison when they did, Erickson could have, like, murdered his entire family. He could have dreamed about killing everybody. He, he could have become a serial <laughs> killer. Well, Erickson filed an appeal in December of 2018, which the court denied because he had already confessed to the crime. In June of 2020, Erickson filed for a rehearing. But why? He did it. I don't know. (laughs) According to him, he did it. Apparently, he, uh, well, he recanted. When he, uh, in the habeas, he recanted and uh, everything they said. Oh, you know, I completely, I completely missed that part. Yeah, no, he, 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 he now says that, well, he says that he doesn't believe that he I don't believe me. (laughs) Well, and, and, you know, Ferguson and Erickson were together that night. That's undisputed. So, no, right, right. You know, because if, if cool Ferguson, sister was buying him drinks at the bar. Right. So if Erickson did it, Ferguson would have done it too. But it's been proven that he was innocent. So it would, by association, prove that Erickson was innocent as I've well. heard of guilty by association. I don't think I've ever heard of innocent by innocent association. Innocent by association. <laughs> well, let's talk about some media coverage, C. Derek. Let's do. In September of 2013, the first book about the Ryan Ferguson case was released. It's called Free Ryan Ferguson, 101 Reasons Why Ryan Ferguson Should Be Released by Brian D'Ambrosio. The book details allegations of police misconduct and intimidation by prosecutor Kevin Crane. There are also accounts of bogus police reports and alleged witnesses claiming that affidavits against Ferguson were signed in their names. D'Ambrosio proposes alternate theories and examines the allegations against Michael Boyd, the final person to speak with the victim. The case has also been featured on 48 Hours, Dateline, and in numerous other newspapers and media outlets. And let's not forget to push Erickson's book here. It's, it's one page, this one page book. 
you open it up and it says, I had a dream. I had a dream. But then he was sued. <laughs> <laughs> a documentary titled Dream Killer detailing. Oh God. Sorry, I'm a writer. I got to critique the hell out of that. That's just way too obvious of a title for a movie. <laughs> Well, it was detailing the case, and Bill Ferguson's journey to free his son debuted at the 2015 Tribeca Film Festival. It aired in August of 2016 as a two-hour special on the Investigation Discovery Network. Let's talk about Ryan's uh, personal life here in a second. So, well, don't you think it's a little too personal? I don't know. He's, he's a public figure now. Oh, so. okay. Soon after he was arrested, Ferguson began devoting his time to fitness and health and became a certified personal trainer. Quote, I know you're innocent, but while you're in there, I can protect you, his father told him four days after his arrest in 2004. You have to do everything you can to make yourself stronger, faster, and smarter to survive. Ferguson began exercising and lifting weights while in prison. By any chance, have you, have you seen this documentary? You know, I have I looked for it and I actually found it, but now you have to pay for it. So really? I, I didn't watch it. I wonder if there's like like a like a workout montage in it, like an eighties movie. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah, with a survivor <laughs> song playing in the background. Well, in, two, in April of 2016, it was announced that Ferguson would host an MTV series entitled Unlocking the Truth, a serialized documentary following other cases of possible wrongful conviction. It's a true story. And I actually have seen some of those episodes, and they're actually so pretty it actually, good. So I, I haven't watched MTV in quite a while. My case isn't some anomaly. It's not something that just randomly happened. Like this happens to people all the time. I'm here to, to look into cases where people were in the same position that I was in, spending their life in prison, and they're saying that they did not commit the crime they're in prison for. I know that there are 60,000 people, and these are conservative estimates, 60,000 people right now in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Working with Eva, my partner in, in this series, is, is great because we're definitely two different personalities. And so you need both personalities, I think, to get people to open up and then to talk about the facts. Well, in 2022, Ferguson joined the television program The Amazing Race. And as of this taping, is still in the race. He joined with his childhood friend, Dusty Harris. I fully expect them to win. They're both smart, athletic, and can work well together. And they're avoiding parking lots. That's right. Do never go into another parking lot, especially at 2.20 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing good happens in a parking lot at 2.20 in the morning unless you're trying to buy weed. Exactly. Well, do we have any final thoughts? Man, uh, like I said, this was the first I ever knew about this case. I heard this name over and over again, but never bothered to investigate who this person was or why he was in the media so often. I'm one of those people in like late 2015 that turned their cable off mm. and just stopped watching television. So I didn't know anything about this MTV uh, show or him appearing on The Amazing Race. Uh, this, this case sounds a lot like some other cases that we have covered and that we're going to cover in the next few weeks. Well, so. it, is, it is scary to see uh, what prosecutors can do when they just ignore any evidence that shows that the person may not be the one that they're looking for. Right. And well, they're, they're, just so they're elected dead. officials. Too. Yeah. Uh, you know, district attorneys uh, and county attorneys, district attorneys, all that. They're elected officials. They're, they're placed there by the people. They're getting paid no matter what. If they suck at what they're doing, if they're good at what they're doing, they're they're getting paid. That that money is coming no matter what. So some of them kind of ho hum through it. Some of them uh, they make it their sole purpose to throw people behind bars, even if that means these people are innocent, right. depending on their race, their sexual orientation, depending on where you live and what I guess the uh, 
the thoughts of the locals in that area would be. Well, and actually one of the reasons I wanted to start with Ryan Ferguson for season three is because he was a straight white guy. And, you know, that's that to me shows that, you know, yes, we know that there's bias in the criminal justice system against, you know, minorities and, and, and LGBTQ and all that. But, you know, it, this just goes to show that when, when a prosecutor gets it in their mind that they have the right person, sometimes, obviously not all the time, and we like to think and we like to trust that most of the elected public officials that we, that we entrust with our uh, criminal justice system are, are true and uh, honorary people, but sometimes getting the conviction is more important than getting the right person. Well, investigating is hard, Scott. <laughs> oh, Investi- I know. <laughs> investigating is hard. And if you can just go ahead and finger your suspect, point them out. <laughs> we don't want anybody to uh, get, get the wrong idea there. If you go ahead and point out your suspect and then mold the case right. around that suspect, it is so much easier than following the trail of clues and then combining all of them together in a big clue sandwich, taking a bite and finding out who that suspect truly is. Right. And that, and you know, we had a little bit of that. We had a lot of that in season one with Brandon Woodruff, but in season two with Vincent Cosey, they arrested the guy the next morning and had nothing but this person that didn't even really know him saying, yeah, I heard him in the background of a phone call, you know, 20 minutes before she was she was murdered. Along with an entire police department that's like, look, tell the guy he better turn himself in because my guys may or may not have itchy trigger <laughs> fingers. Right, exactly. All right, see, Derek, that's going to do it for another episode of the American Justice Podcast. Until next time, we should remind them to stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. See you next time. Bye. And now, it's time for the outtakes. Other evidence that had been withheld from the original. I don't. I don't even know how to silence that thing. Honestly, <laughs> it's the. Um, maybe someone's leaving. Maybe Dan's leaving a voicemail right now. Hi, this is Dan. Somehow I'm listening to your bullshit. <laughs> I've got your apartment bug, Scott. <laughs> and what did you say about me, mother? <laughs> Remember, Dan spelled backward is his nad. <laughs> the American Justice Punk is owned and copyrighted by Atua Productions, LLC of Dallas, Texas. Your hosts are Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Atua Productions aims for this to be an interactive podcast where you, the audience, has a great amount of influence on the content of our shows. You can interact with us in several ways. First and most preferred is you can leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 972-942-0444. Be sure to leave your name and city you're calling from, along with whether or not we can use your voice on the air. If Facebook is more your style, you can log on to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash American Justice Podcast. Feel free to leave a comment, or you can message us on Messenger if you have a more pressing question or issue. If you'd like to blog about the show, you can log on to AmericanJusticePodcast.com and let us know what you think there. If you're a tweeter, you can also voice your opinion on Twitter at A Justice Podcast. We would very much appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review on all the podcast streaming platforms.